Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as moderator for today's program. Progressing towards performance specifications for pavements. Our presenter today is Dr. Shri Rao. Uh, what I'll be doing is covering a few housekeeping items with you at the beginning of the program. I'll give you a bit of background about Dr. Rao's experience and knowledge. I'll turn the program over to Dr. Rao. And then I'll be back with you to moderate the Q&A program uh, at the conclusion of the technical presentation. Next slide, please. So a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you're having a, an issue with the webinar, specifically the audio, we'd, and you're using your computer speakers, we ask you to turn those speakers off, call in using your phone. If you continue to have a problem, then go to the chat, which is highlighted in slide number two. Note the slide numbers in the lower right-hand corner. And send a, a chat message only to the host. We'll do our very best to help you. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, we'll be hosting, I'll be moderating a Q&A program at the conclusion of the technical presentation. So if you'd like to ask a question, and we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the entire program will defer answering questions until the conclusion of the technical program. Go to Q&A, you see that highlighted in slide number three. Direct that question to the host and the panelists only, please. That'll help us do a better job of bookkeeping. Next slide, please. Finally, if you'd like to see the presentation in full screen, go to the top of your center of your um, viewer. Over on the right hand side, you see a down arrow, you can highlight the view, and then highlight full screen, and you should see a best presentation that you can relative to the program today. Next slide, please. Now, for those of you who don't know Dr. Rao, I'll give you a brief background. He is a professional engineer and a PhD. He achieved his PhD at the University of Illinois. He's currently a group leader and a principal engineer at ARA's research and development group. He has over 25 years of experience and during that period he's led, managed, and participated as a, both a re, as a researcher, a consultant, developer of content, and uh, an instructor uh, for NHI and other types of training programs on topics related to pavements, geotechnical, and materials issues. Now, specifically to today's topic, he's currently a PI on several FHWA projects related to performance specifications, as well as a National Academy study on that same topic. So with that, I'd like to introduce my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Shri Brown. Shri. Thank you very much, Jerry, and uh, thank you everyone for attending my presentation today uh, on ARA's webinar Wednesdays. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is uh, talk about uh, why we're developing performance specifications, some steps towards implementing performance specifications. I'll talk a little bit about some index tests for basic design qualification and acceptance, and then I'll talk about performance modeling for some enhanced performance education. Uh, what I'm going to present today is a very high level overview of the subject. Uh, clearly in 45 minutes, I cannot do a deeper dive into the subject, which would take, uh, I would think, at least a two to three day course. There's a lot of material to pick and choose from. I do want to give credit to a lot of um, my collaborators and peers, those who've done uh, work and uh, and expanded the knowledge, uh, the body of knowledge in this area. A lot of good work uh, continues to be done on this front by many groups uh, and under the stewardship of Federal Highway Administration and some of the state DOPs across the U.S. Uh, dozens of individuals who work on them on these uh, different uh, topic areas under performance specifications. Uh, I'll name some as we progress through this presentation, but I apologize if I in advance if I leave anyone out. Uh, another thing you'll notice in my presentation is that I've deliberately tried to stay away from terminology, uh, uh, but uh, I will mention it a few times, things like performance engineer pavements, performance engineer mix design, balance mix design, performance engineer mixtures. Um, 
I want to keep my presentation at a higher level and talk about the uh, different elements that uh, uh, that we want to cover when we think about performance. So one of the reasons performance specifications can be a little confusing is that each agency's experience with performance is quite unique. And think of this uh, like a road trip. Uh, each agency has a different starting point in terms of where they are for performance. Each agency wants to end at a different point. Each agencies might go from that starting point to the ending point through different paths. Uh, each agency may stop at different points to evaluate where they are in terms of implementing their performance specification. Each agency may want to go at a different pace to go from point A to point B. Uh, and each agency may uh, go a certain way and take a different detour and think that, hey, I, I need to do something else. So. There are many different paths in order to attain a performance specification, uh, and there are many different goals for performance specifications. And uh, there, uh, and part of the reason is each agency's expectations and the reality of performance are unique. Um, each agency has different cultures, different funding priorities, uh, different conditions of their roadway assets, uh, different materials and design and construction practices or contractors who do their construction. Um, different expectations of their performance um, and also very, very different risk tolerances in terms of where they uh, are willing to take some risks and where they are willing to share some risk with the contractors. So uh, because of that, the pathways towards performance specifications can be very different from one agency to another. Um, and so that, having said that, that's why I'm, I'm going to keep this talk at a high level. Uh, and in the first part of my presentation, I'll talk about why develop performance specifications. So I'll talk about that in the next five slides or so. Um, I want to start with the definition of performance specification. And uh, this is the definition from the Transportation Research Circular uh, Glossary of Transportation Construction QA Terms. And this is the August 2018. Uh, I like this definition. It's pretty concise, but there's many different items I want to highlight. Um, and they are underlined here. Uh, they describe how the finished product should perform over time. And that should perform over time allows for some flexibility in terms of the specific details of the specification. That allows for some uh, flexibility in terms of whether you're going to do performance uh, uh, based or warranties or end result specifications or, or broad spectrum of what performance really entails. Uh, in the end, the key issue is to uh, look at the performance and then time, and those elements need to be somehow incorporated to make sure your materials and your construction uh, performs over the prescribed time. Uh, performance specifications uh, includes mixtures. And a lot of times when you think about performance specifications, uh, you may have just heard about uh, some of the mixtures and some of the mixture uh, practices related to mixtures, such as performance engineer, mixture design, balance mixture design. Uh, but keep in mind, performance does not just, uh, it does not have to be limited to mixtures. You want to talk about the entire pavement and the pavement structure. Uh, so it's not just the mixtures, but the construction practices, the base and sub base and subgrade conditions and all of that tie in together in order to make the asset perform. Um, it includes different types of specifications and uh, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of the differences between these specifications, but uh, really you're, we're trying to, uh, in the end, uh, we're trying to improve the performance of our asset. Uh, a common thread really is a tie in between the tested quality characteristic and the relevant performance measure. So that's really what we're trying to do with the performance uh, uh, specification. <clears throat> in general, if you want your asset to perform, and again, this is a simplistic drawing or a diagram, but if you want your asset to perform, you wanna design it properly, uh, you wanna select the proper materials, uh, and you wanna construct it properly. So all of these components are important for performance. And so they are interrelated in terms of how long the pavement is going to perform. Now, while ideally you would like to um, design it at the highest and, uh, and best level possible, you would like to select the best materials possible, you would like to do the best construction practices possible. Uh, in reality, there is a balance, and that's what engineering is all about. There's a balance between uh, all these different components and optimizing these key components. And that balance is important to attain 
uh, cost goals in terms of engineering. So we have to optimize our design, we have to optimize our materials, and we have to uh, get, uh, you know, typically uh, uh, the best construction possible. But even that, uh, on a low bit environment, you actually end up optimizing what the construction is to attain a certain cost. So the benefits of performance specifications, um, and I'm comparing this to a, a little bit more prescriptive type of specification, is that they provide some linkage between what the design expectations are. Because when we say design, what we're really doing is designing for a certain performance. We're designing for a certain performance life. And so performance specifications kind of provide that linkage between the design expectation and the construction and materials quality. Uh, and that is the fundamental difference between a performance specification uh, and a conventional construction specification where that linkage between the design and the uh, construction and material quality is not that strong. Uh, one of the things that happens with performance specifications is that some of the product performance risk uh, is transferred from the agency to the contractor. So in a performance specification, you, uh, you uh, specify how the end product is going to uh, potentially perform and in exchange for that, uh, so it's not saying exactly how you want it constructed. Uh, in exchange for that, you uh, limit the prescriptive requirements and allow the contractor to have more control. So, uh, you, um, so that gives the contractor some flexibility in terms of how they produce the uh, payment. Now, in the long run, again, this is. Uh, you know, in, in, initially, you may have some uh, different um, cost profiles as contractors adjust to the new specifications, uh, and there may be some hesitancy in that uh, aspect. But in the long run, uh, if, uh, if you move towards performance specification, it, you will end up a, a better and more optimized uh, construction practices of optimized design, optimized performance. And and and, uh, and really reduce the long term cost to the agency and the traveling public. Uh, and the goal, of, of course, is to provide improvements to the payment life. Uh, the contractor benefits uh, performance specifications. Of course, there is a learning curve in terms of uh, the different tests that the, the, an agency might choose and how they evaluate the uh, uh, the asset once it's produced and. So from that perspective, uh, there is the contractor may have some trepidation, but uh, uh, for a contractor to succeed in a performance specification, they have to have good quality control practices and uh, exceed the target quality and also improve the consistency. So all of these benefit an agency uh, in the long run and then uh, ideally would benefit, uh, will reduce the long term cost. So that's kind of the baseline for establishing why develop performance specifications. Uh, the next uh, set of slides, I'm going to talk about some steps towards implementing performance specifications. Uh, we can, as uh, Jerry mentioned, we currently have a project uh, on with the National Cooperative Highway Research Program in CHRP 10-107, under which we're developing a guide for implementing performance specifications. Um, our team and partner, National Center for Asphalt Technologies, NCAT at Auburn, uh, develop some of these steps in collaboration with, with the University of Nevada, Reno. And uh, what we are doing in our project is develop some guidelines based on these steps. And part of the reason we did this in collaboration is we didn't want to have uh, different uh, messages going out in terms of the different steps. So uh, and the guidelines will have very uh, significant details in terms of each of these uh, steps for performance specifications. Um, NCAT is doing these, uh, developing the guidelines for the asphalt, uh, and ARA is developing the guidelines for the concrete treatments. So the first step, and there are eight slides and corresponding to eight different steps. The first step is to understand and communicate the why and the benefits. Um, um, outline why a new approach is needed based on questions to consider. So the, the, the key message here is that, you know, traditional um, for asphalt volumetric based mixture design may not provide an optimum performance for asphalt mixtures. Um, and similarly, on the concrete side, the traditional concrete mixtures are accepted based on measurements that are not tied to the performance or durability of the concrete. So, uh, so the, the new way of doing things is, is asking certain questions. Is my pavement performing as designed or exceeding the design life? 
Um, how do we establish some consistency between design materials and construction? Uh, and uh, are there any specific materials or construction related distresses that need to be addressed? Are we getting the best value for our construction dollars? Um, should we incentivize quality construction um, and uh, uh, or disincentivize marginal construction? Uh, is it important uh, and what are we willing to pay to transfer the risk from agency to contractor? Um, so those are the kind of questions you want to ask in this initial stage. Uh, should we provide the contractor some flexibility in terms of their construction practices? Uh, in this initial stage, it is important to get a uh, buy-in from uh, from uh, top management, get some commitment from external stakeholders. Um, that includes you know, industry, contractors, um, at, at universities uh, in your um, state, academia, um, some internal stakeholders, and that could include district engineers and staff, quality assurance staff, uh, design staff, uh, uh, even uh, materials and testing technicians. So you really want, the, the first step is really um, getting started and, and communicating the why and why are we doing this? Why are we going down this path of a uh, new way of specifying uh, papers? The next step is to plan and prepare. Uh, and under this step, uh, I've listed uh, seven bullet items. Um, and uh, in this business, almost nothing gets done unless there is a champion. Uh, and champions can be at the state DOT. Um, there could be an industry champion, there could be a university or academia champion, there could be a large contractor uh, who is willing to champion performance specifications. And the champions really provide leadership and direction uh, towards performance specifications. <laughs> Once you identify the champion, uh, then you establish stakeholder partnerships, uh, establish a joint industry uh, and agency task force, and this could include uh, many different folks uh, from the central office, from the district office, uh, industry, contractors, and uh, that allows you to get some focus and direction in terms of the, uh, as you develop and, and progress towards performance specifications. Um, these uh, these uh, um, partnerships will identify and address any issues or pitfalls and help with coordinate, coordinating and overcoming any institutional roadblocks and hurdles that we have. Uh, do your homework, and this is important. Uh, identify what issues you have with your current payment performance, uh, materials, and construction quality. W what are you trying to achieve? What are the gaps in your performance? And so identify the issues, and then look at what resources are available. Resources are available for these issues, um, in terms of literature, in terms of uh, lab testing, in terms of uh, universities, academics, consultants, and then. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information that's shared through peer exchanges and workshops to so learn from other people's experience when you do your homework. Uh, once you kind of establish this uh, level of knowledge and then you start establishing the goals for your performance specifications. And goals, you may have heard of the acronym SMART, S-M-A-R-T, which is uh, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So you want to establish goals that are SMART goals and the goals really uh, uh, focus you and allow you to figure out what is the improvement I need for payment performance um, and allow you to optimize uh, your design. Uh, and you can even establish goals for specific payment layers or for specific mixtures for specific payment applications. Um, you know, you may decide to do it only for a certain class of roadways. Uh, and so whatever it is, whether it is improving your acceptance practices, uh, design and construction of long lasting payments. Uh, so uh, this is where you decide where in that map I showed you of the US road network, what is my end goal? What is my end destination for my uh, performance specifications? And then once you have that, you map the tasks, you review all the tasks and subtasks. And you know, the more details you develop in this map task, uh, and uh, the, uh, and you associate some timelines in terms of the goals, the better you are able to uh, uh, follow uh, and, and make some progress. So you, you have to have a clear uh, um, mapping of the task and make sure that all of those are considered over time. Now, some of these tasks may be internal and some of these tasks will be external. Um, and then you look for some external support. And again, uh, there's a lot of federal, national and regional uh, resources, whether it is universities, whether it is consultants, um, 
uh, whether it is uh, peers from neighboring states, uh, a lot of resources available in order to plan and prepare with, uh, your performance expectations. Uh, and then develop an implementation timeline. So break it down in terms of the goals you've established and the tasks and subtasks and develop some timelines to achieve that. Now, some of these can be done in parallel uh, while others may need to be done more successfully. Um, this is probably the task that may take a lot of time. Uh, here's where you identify uh, what are your primary modes of distress that you're seeing at, an at your agency and what kind of performance uh, are you expecting what kind of performance neighboring agencies are seeing in their pavements? And so uh, identify the distresses you want to um, address in your performance specification and the performance period you want these uh, pavements to, uh, these distresses to perform over. Um, I'll get into a little bit more detail as I talk about some of the performance tests uh, about this. Uh, but then you also identify and assess what performance tests you want to use. And then if the the real big task under this is really to validate the performance test. You want to make sure that uh, these test results have a strong relationship with field performance uh, and review and assess the validity and application of these uh, studies. W what other agencies have done? What are other research? Uh, it, does that match your own experience? And in this, you may be you may have to build some test sections or do some accelerated loading uh, testing. Look at your uh, uh, payment management. A system a database and get some information from there. Uh, so there may be a lot of different things you would have to do to see which is the test that works best for your needs. The next step, the fourth step is to um, really get uh, get moving. So a lot of the the last three steps was to kind of establish uh, and, and uh, figure about where we are and what we need to do. And now we start uh, moving into uh, how to actually execute the performance specification. So this includes uh, acquiring the necessary equipment once you've identified the test, uh, managing resources such as uh, workspace and labor and uh, workload of your current staff. Um, you also need uh, some initial training and uh, that means uh, training in uh, preparing of uh, samples and testing and test methods. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, videos out there. Sometimes on some of the new tests, you may have to get the training from the equipment manufacturer. Uh, there may be some third-party training, uh, either videos or um, and so on that you can review under this uh, task. Um, and then you start evaluating the test uh, in terms of uh, how can this test be used in more routine practice. This is a practical test. Uh, what, what are the different uh, aspects of the test uh, that um, that are advantages and what are the limitations and how do I use it within my program? And there may be some research that may be needed to complete any missing or incomplete information here. You may have to develop some uh, standards, some programs, some worksheets. You, may, you could use some existing standards or update those standards. Uh, you may have to develop some material handling and testing protocols and things like that. So, uh, and, and then finally, you also want to make sure that the different labs that you're using for uh, acceptance or independent assurance or even uh, in-house labs, um, they have some uniformity. And so you have to, you may have to do some studies in terms of the repeatability uh, <clears throat> to see what is the variability within the lab uh, and between labs and, uh, and understand the factors that uh, impact the test variability. Once you have that, now, now we start kind of uh, making more, uh, uh, getting to more to the field aspect of, uh, uh, of uh, the performance specifications. Uh, we'll review at historical data and learn from previous experience of performance testing and you extract any historical data um, from, um, from your QA databases and things like that, review that. Uh, and do some benchmarking studies to see how existing mixtures, how existing uh, materials perform using these performance tests. So that's where you, and once you have that, then you can start thinking about a shadow project. The shadow project is a project where uh, it's mostly for informational purposes, as there's no change uh, in either the contract or specifications for the project itself. Uh, and the goals of a shadow project are to better familiarize uh, state DOT and contract personnel with the test, um, to add to the database of knowledge for uh, and gather information on typical variability and so on. So here's where you uh, 
<coughs> actually try to get a feel for how this test will work in real world uh, conditions. And then you would you could use that information that you collect in the shadow project to analyze uh, the production data. And then based on that, you may also have to um, know, or a contractor may actually have to determine how to adjust the, any of these mixtures for local materials. Once you have a, a few shadow projects done, you may do one or two to uh, learn uh, how those work, uh, how those tests work. Uh, then you start developing a, a performance specification. Um, and here's where you start thinking about the sampling and testing plan. Um, if you're going to have some kind of pay adjustment based on the performance uh, quality measures that you test. Uh, and you also want to finalize your uh, specifications at this stage. So these are your final specifications um, for <clears throat> what we call as a pilot project. A pilot project is different from a, um, uh, from a shadow project in that a pilot project have real world consequences to the contractor. So they would actually uh, bid on a performance specification uh, and uh, and then they will be awarded an incentive or incentive incentive. Uh, the the <clears throat> the acceptance will be made based on the performance specification. Um, now you may have to tinker the language uh, on that, uh, if, given that it's a pilot project. Uh, and then once you have uh, conducted the pilot project, then you do your final analysis and revise the specification. Uh, once you have a few pilot projects done, the next the thing is to train, certify, develop, and update any training and certification programs. And and this this is where now it becomes a more agency level uh, practice. Um, so pretty much uh, different districts are trained on it. There may be some certification program for different labs, um, accreditation program requirements. So here's where you uh, develop and establish all of that uh, because you've learned what you need to do for your performance specification in step six. And then this is the final step, um, the initial implementation of the performance specification. Uh, here's a way you communicate any changes and new requirements to industry and agency personnel. But it's not just uh, important to communicate this, but there has to be a way to get feedback on the performance specification and may even have to update the performance specification. Um, and uh, at this stage, you may want to um, select only a handful of projects, the right projects for initial implementation uh, as, as you, uh, you know, you may cho choose a, a medium sized project or a large project or a small project, whatever your preferences are, and, and focus on how the performance specifications work in uh, two or three different scenarios. And, and uh, you may need to end up tweaking the performance specification based on that. So those were the eight initial steps. Uh, again, I kind of uh, went through it pretty quickly um, during the time limitation. Um, the next uh, about 10 slides or so, I'm gonna talk about index tests for mixture design qualification and acceptance. Uh, as many of you understand that uh, these tests are really the, uh, the backbone of the performance specifications. And so um, I'll briefly cover that. Uh, ma uh, many researchers have developed some good practical test to characterize performance and each has its advantages and disadvantages and I'm not going to go over uh, each test uh, but I'm just going to give a flavor of the, some of the tests that are uh, available. <clears throat> and so I'm going to break my talk up into asphalt index tests and concrete index tests. Uh, for asphalt, generally speaking, performance tests uh, uh, try to achieve some kind of balance between, uh, for mixtures, try to achieve some kind of balance between rutting and cracking performance. Uh, and also there's usually some kind of a moisture damage component to that. So you want a mixture that is stable, you want to make sure that it's durable, and in the performance tests, it, it, you want to consider aging, traffic, climate, even location within the pavement. Uh, now the dials you can turn in order to uh, meet uh, any of these criteria are uh, the binder content, even the binder grade, the type of aggregate you choose, the gradation of aggregate you choose, uh, <coughs> and uh, even um, how much of recycled asphalt pavements or shingles uh, will you have in the pavement. Uh, there's many different tests uh, for performance and you want to match the test to your needs and the distresses that you see. Um, there's four distresses I've shown in this uh, slide on the bottom left is a fatigue crack on, uh, on, on then the second from the left uh, <clears throat> is the thermal crack uh, 
on an asphalt pavement, some rutting, and then the one on the right uh, is a reflection crack. So depending on what is your typical distress and what tests uh, are best suited for the distress, uh, you uh, choose your performance test. Uh, and then you establish some thresholds based on field conditions, variability of the test, and your experience and practicality of the test. Um, there's four, uh, here's some uh, tests that are typically done for rutting. These are some of the more common tests. You have the asphalt payment analyzer, the hamburg Wilfrack test, the stress sweep rutting test, a flow number test. Um, again, some of these are uh, are simple index tests, while, uh, for example, the stress free writing uh, might give you more than just uh, an index property. It might give, it, it will give you uh, something that would allow you to even model the performance of the material. So uh, there's different types of tests that give different properties. Um, and, uh, under NCHRP 10 107, the NCAT uh, has uh, our teaming partner on that. Um, it has developed a whole list of these tests, and I'm not going to go over these tests, but there's a lot of different uh, tests to um, evaluate the rutting resistance of pavement. And as you can see, uh, some of them have ASTRO standards, some of them have temporary ASTRO standards, some of them do not yet have ASTRO standards, uh, and they measure different uh, test parameters. So again, it depends uh, on your your uh, what you are comfortable with and what, how far you want to progress on that map towards performance specifications, um, you would select one of these tests. Uh, on 10-107, 10, 10 NCAT has also developed these uh, basically one pagers on each of these tests. So this allows you a starting point uh, for uh, evaluating the test and some more details are provided uh, in our guidance documents on that research. But uh, here's an example for the asphalt pavement analyzer um, that, that it shows the developers, it shows the test standard, uh, it talks a little bit about the basics, some costs, uh, the some information on the test, some key references, uh, and some agencies that have adopted it. So this gives you a little bit of a snapshot uh, of this specific test and um, uh, these kind of snapshots are available for uh, uh, the wide variety of writing tests. <clears throat> Next, I'll talk a little bit about cracking tests. And again, um, similar to writing tests, there's a broad range of cracking tests. Uh, I've shown four here, the drip tension, uh, security test, uh, the Illinois flexibility index test, I fit uh, the ideal CT on the uh, right, and then the top is the DCT test. Again, a lot of these tests um, have their uh, strengths and their uh, limitations. And as you go <clears throat> and you select what is best suited for your agency, uh, consider those strengths and limitations in mind. Um, <clears throat> here's the whole list of tests uh, that were uh, identified in NCHRP 10 107. Uh, and this list kind of, um, and, and, and honestly, there may be even other tests, but uh, uh, this gives us a, a, a list of uh, starting point uh, for the different uh, asphalt pavement cracking tests to consider. Uh, they all measure different things. They have different uh, 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 different ways, uh, different standards uh, associated with it, different sample preparations, different fabrication, different requirements uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, testing um, <coughs> time and, and preparation and, and so on. So. Um, uh, there's, uh, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, this is, uh, this test is better than this test or this, uh, you know, or choose this. Every, every test has, uh, has some, something that it offers and, um, and, and, uh, depending on your distress and the equipment you have and in the agency's condition, you may have to choose the right test for your situation. Um, again, uh, well, NCAT has developed this, uh, th this is an example for, uh, a summary of a uh, asphalt pavement cracking test uh, that was developed by NCAT. This is specifically on this slide is the BCT test uh, developed by um, Dr. Butler, who's now at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, and so this, there's this kind of a, a description of the test and uh, this you could use this as a starting point to evaluate uh, the test. Uh, now, this, this specific test is the test that uh, I believe is one of the tests that the Illinois Tollway uh, is using uh, in their road towards performance specifications. One thing I did want to, um, so I, I talked a lot about 
uh, mixtures and mixture tests. Uh, but I, uh, I do want to emphasize that maybe, uh, at least in my personal opinion, uh, you know, we need to uh, think about more than just mixtures when we think about performance. Um, and that's why on the bottom part of this, uh, you know, in the field, when you, when you put this material in the field, in the end, the main thing we are concerned about is how it performs in the field. And so there are other elements such as density, right quality, um, other quality characteristics. There may be some surface characteristics that you are interested in performance. There may be some um, quality of the base or sub base that uh, that you are interested in terms of long term performance and uh, even in terms of rehabilitation. So all of those things um, should be considered when you talk about a complete performance specification. Uh, I mean, clearly you can start with mixtures. You can start with uh, getting the right mixture and uh, but if you're, if you, I really see as this industry progresses uh, towards more and more performance specifications, uh, we will add some of these elements of the base, the sub base, uh, uh, the right characteristics, the surface texture, all of these um, can be uh, developed in terms of performance specifications. Um, so, in terms of acceptance of asphalt, um, you know, there's two parts to it there's the acceptance of the mixture. Uh, and you could uh, do that as a combination of volumetrics and performance. Um, and again, even that, there are some nuanced levels on whether you do a volumetric design and then do performance verification, or you do a performance design, or you do some kind of uh, um, a way in which you start with uh, a, a, a temporary volumetric design, a, a, a binary content, look at uh, what the performance tests are, and then have to tweak the uh, volumetrics of it in order to meet the performance criteria. Um, and again, like I said, when you get to the field, uh, you may choose to do um, just the volumetric tests uh, and performance, uh, or you may cho choose to do just the volumetrics or performance if you have a way to tie in uh, your performance test with some uh, volumetric measures. Uh, and I already talked about some of these other characteristics that affect performance. That was a quick overview of the asphalt performance test. I'm going to talk a little bit about concrete uh, index test. And again, similar to the asphalt side, uh, the concrete side, um, you're trying to balance uh, the structural component of it, the strength of it, uh, with the durability. And again, you want to consider traffic, climate, uh, and the pavement structure. Uh, in this slide, I've shown many different distresses. On the bottom left is a transverse crack. Uh, typically, um, you need the right strength and thickness for that, so the design comes into picture. Uh, but you can have durability cracking. Um, uh, the bottom right is a joint. Uh, you can see the deterioration of the joint due to uh, salts in the joint. Um, you can see the top right, uh, there's, there's a photo of some poor consolidation in concrete. Uh, and then you can see some other durability distresses in the bottom, uh, including scaling and some kind of a map cracking or ASL or so on. So the tools you have in order to control this are cement content type uh, using different SEM, supplementary cementitious materials, uh, the ag aggregate uh, uh, gradation, um, uh, the admixtures we use, um, for example, air and training admixtures we use and how much to use and things like that. So you have some control over the mixtures uh, of the for the concrete mixture. Uh, again, uh, in concrete, as in the case of asphalt, there are many different tests, and you select the test based on your needs and the distresses that you're trying to control. Um, and then you establish your thresholds for the test based on field conditions, uh, the variability of the test, and so on. Here are some, uh, a slide that shows some of the different tests that are used for concrete. Uh, again, um, Depending on the property of interest, uh, so the top left is a box test for uh, workability. Uh, the super air meter uh, measures <coughs> is a measure for durability and the distribution of air within uh, the concrete mixture. Uh, the modified weekly is a, a measure of workability. Uh, you can do a calcium oxychloride test to see uh, how the cement is affected by. Uh, uh, by uh, chlorine and, and uh, other deleterious materials that enter in uh, the freezing and thawing test. And then top right are some resistivity tests. Again, uh, resistivity is a measure of how, um, how uh, water and other uh, chemicals can uh, transport through the concrete itself. 
Um, so this, so for index tests, again, uh, I'm going to go through the next few slides pretty quickly. Um, there are many different tests and there are many different national standards. Some of them are regular standards and some of them temporary standard. Um, you want sufficient strength uh, to, um, to ensure that it performs over time. Uh, you want a workable mixture, uh, improved concrete place, placement, um, which, which workable mixtures, uh, if, you, if a mixture is workable, that impacts the durability and readability of the concrete. Um, you want stable aggregates, and so you want to identify uh, aggregates that have potential deep cracking, um, so expansion, and, and uh, really the expansion uh, of aggregates, uh, it, and there are many different reasons they expand, um, you know, whether it's water or um, alkali reaction, uh, ASR, uh, and, and that causes the concrete matrix to crack. So there's different tests to test for that, uh, to test for your aggregate uh, in terms of its potency to crack the concrete paste. Um, and then the concrete paste itself, how permeable it is to reduce passage of water uh, and aggressive fluids into the concrete. And so there's tests for resistivity, conductivity, chloride penetration. Um, and then there's tests for the freeze thaw durability of concrete, uh, the resistance to freeze thaw damage and chemical attack, uh, and then shrinkage, um, uh, you know, resistance to moisture warping and restraint cracking. Again, a little different from the asphalt side, there's many different tests in terms of the concrete mixture itself and how it performs in uh, field conditions. Uh, and then finally, uh, sulfate resistance test that re uh, to reduce potential expansion uh, due to uh, sulfate. Uh, and even surface abrasion and erosion to make sure you have the right surface characteristics for your concrete fixture. So there is a lot of uh, different tests that you could do um, in terms of performance of the entire pavement structure, not just the mixture itself. Uh, and likewise, as in the case of the um, asphalt side, on the concrete side for NCHRP 10-107, we are developing uh, these one pages to kind of summarize uh, different tests and provide some um, basic information on the test and then also include some details uh, in terms of these different tests and this an example of that and this one uh, is the, the resistivity test that many of you are probably already familiar with. Um, the last maybe three, four, five minutes, I'm going to talk about some performance modeling for enhanced performance specifications. And I, I know that everybody has a different um, view of what performance specifications mean and most, uh, uh, many agencies kind of stop with index tests and stop with um, you know, what, what is attained. Um, in, an index test typically are, are, can or give you a pass fail. Okay, this, uh, this measure is passing or this uh, test is failing uh, for a mixture. Uh, but in terms of performance modeling itself, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of value in taking performance specifications to the next level. Uh, and here's an example of what is being done at North Carolina State University uh, under the stewardship of Federal Highway Administration. Uh, and this is for asphalt pavements, and uh, this is a pass flex system. Uh, the testing is done with the AMPT, and there's software tools developed uh, such as FlexMat um, for the mixture um, properties and then how it performs in a pavement system through FlexPave. Uh, and so uh, this. This system allows you to not just quantify a mixture from an index perspective, but also allows you to quantify the performance model of how that mixture will perform. And so that allows you to, so it's like seeing the world in color rather than black and white. You, it allows you to, uh, uh, to look at uh, a performance in terms of time and, and specifically in within the pavement structure of interest. And so uh, uh, the models that are used in the PASPEC system allow you to, uh, and these are the different models, allow you to characterize the fatigue cracking, thermal cracking, rutting, and even aging uh, of the materials uh, over time. So you can then uh, be very uh, clear about uh, how this will perform in given the traffic conditions, given the subject support conditions, and so on. Um, similarly, on the concrete side, um, you know, I talked about the mixture and mixture characteristics, but uh, one of the efforts we're doing with the highway, uh, where uh, we have, um, it, it's not just enough to use the index test and say the mixture is passing or failing, but to actually model them in terms of the performance and come up with 
how is it going to change over time? And so from that perspective, uh, we are looking at not just the uh, material properties, but also the payment structure itself, uh, strength, thickness, smoothness, uh, the dial, uh, effective dial diameter, uh, and so on. And use that, uh, relate that to some fundamental engineering properties uh, based on which we use that to predict uh, life and that can be used then to make some pay adjustments and offer some incentives and disincentives. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the things that um, one of our uh, colleagues, Jason Weiss at Oregon State University, uh, we've implemented um, his uh, free spa model. Uh, and again, what this model, and again, I, I'm not going to go into the details, in fact, I'm running out of time, uh, but what this allows us to do is characterize how uh, the pavement be, will behave in real world conditions and how the free spa, how, how much free spa damage will occur within the pavement structure over time, uh, given a set of uh, real world conditions. So uh, implementing a performance model as opposed to an index test allows us to bring in that time domain and the change over time, which can then be allowed to offer incentives and disincentives uh, based on where we think a uh, pavement will be, uh, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, depending on the design life uh, or some other um, measure that we want to use. Um, this is the last uh, few slides uh, before I wrap up. Uh, so, so if you have a performance specification where you can um, develop it over time, uh, you do need to do some preparation uh, in terms of establishing some baselines. Um, and then develop the specifications. And then during construction, you want to evaluate uh, the mixture. So uh, this is, uh, again, something that uh, uh, Dr. Ricky Kim and Shane Underwood uh, from um, NCSU developed for the AMPT suite of tests. But again, but it's very similar on the concrete side as well. You have your typical mixtures, you do your performance test, uh, you evaluate those mixtures. Um, you, you may establish a database of different uh, mixtures uh, and how they perform and use that as a reference. Now, again, uh, I'm not gonna go into details of volumetric versus performances, but uh, keep in mind, you can uh, you can translate this uh, performance, uh, the lab performance to some volumetrics, or you can uh, just use the performance indicators themselves in the field in order to evaluate. Each one of them has its uh, benefits and uh, limitations in terms of uh, what that means in, for quality assurance practices. Um, and then you can put that into your software program, uh, develop some pay models, a cost model, and then based on that, you develop pay tables. So the advantage of having uh, a performance model is that uh, you can tie that into a cost model and then tie that into some kind of an incentive disincentive payment based on uh, the cost model. Uh, and then when you actually construct the payment, you evaluate it based on the same uh, tools that you use to design and construct the roadway and then pay the incentives based on that. So this is my final slide. Um, a lot of things that I covered in a very short time. Um, keep in mind, performance specification is really a journey, not a destination. I, I think you can keep tinkering, constantly move forward, uh, better practices, better materials, develop better models, better tests, uh, incorporate more elements, not just the asphalt and concrete mixture, but also the base, the sub-base. Uh, even the subgrade and um, and even other uh, elements. If you have a drainage system, for example, what what are the items that you need uh, in order for the asset to perform? Um, and keep in mind, the ultimate goal is basically to have longer payment life and reduce costs. And regardless of what terminology we use, regardless of uh, uh, what uh, practices, materials, and models we use. Um, so with that, Jerry, I'm going to hand it back to you. Yep. Um, next slide, please. So we'll get to the Q&A program momentarily. And thank you, Shri. That was an excellent presentation. And certainly that could uh, be a three-day course without doubt. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that all of our presentations are recorded. This is the 28th webinar that we're offering. Up and coming, we also like to give a variety of topics. And on June 30th, uh, we'll have a topic on modern pavement management for the U.S. Forest Service. So uh, those of you who don't deal in the pavement management area, you think of it only in terms of interstate programs and arterials, but not true. The vast number of roadways uh, are federal roads and don't have the same volume of traffic. 
On July 28th, and the programs uh, will continue the webinar programs through the summer. Uh, July 28th, we'll be speaking about Florida DOT's statewide pavement marking data collection and um, management system. I'd like to remind everybody that all of our presenters are ARA employees. They come from a variety of our 35 or 40 type offices, depending on how we count them. Uh, and then if you'd like to register, uh, if you're not familiar with the program, ARA.com forward slash webinars, get information on the recordings, how to register, keep your eye on your email because we do a fair amount of uh, marketing. Next slide, please. So I'd like to get to the question period and we'll, uh, we have about seven or eight minutes that we'll, we'll go through here. We do have a number of questions. First uh, question is from David uh, and Shri, uh, David's question is, are there guide specifications available today that can be referenced when developing a performance-based specification? And I know David used the term performance-based. Yeah, I think that's a um, really good question. There is a lot of effort that is being done uh, by many different agencies. Um, and I, I would say the best um, answer to that is that uh, look at what the peer agencies are doing. Because that, uh, and as, as I talked in my talk, uh, really you want something that meets your needs. So most performance specifications are tied into very specific test methods, very specific um, um, a collection and analysis of data, uh, either with the mixtures themselves or following uh, construction. And so it's hard to say that there's uh, there's some, and part of what we are doing under HRP 10-107 is developing some of these guidelines and have some, uh, we actually have some case study examples that will also include some guide specifications. Uh, but it is, it's hard because everybody is starting at a different point, ending at a different point, or wanting different things from their specification. Uh, and so there are some guide specifications that are, that have some broad frameworks for what, what a performance specification from an agency perspective entails, uh, and how that actually goes into contract documents. Uh, we ourselves have worked on shadow projects uh, with many different agencies and have developed uh, supplemental uh, uh, provisions, special provisions uh, for specific construction projects. Uh, but I can tell you this, it, is, it can be very different from one agency to another, even, it may be even from one project to another, simply because of the requirements are so different. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we have a question from Amin and uh, is asking for guidance as to where we might be able to find the NCAT detailed list of test methods, which you refer to uh, under the asphalt index test. Um, I believe it's not published yet and it will be a part of our, you know, we are still working on NCHRP 10-107 and it will be uh, included as part of that guidance document that, uh, you know, we, sh we should have our guidelines, okay, it's, uh, it's we should have our report, one for us, but one for concrete, uh, developed sometime in the next few months. Uh, and there is a, a period in which we will evaluate those, we uh, reach out to uh, different agencies on the asphalt side and concrete side and, and work with them to evaluate the specifications, uh, the, the guide guidelines. Uh, and then those will be published sometime next year. There'll actually be some workshops as part of this contract as well, and then those will be published. Um, sometime next year. Um, I do not, as some of this is work in progress, so those tables that you see uh, are graphs, and so we, we will have to evaluate them. And also those change tables, the right, information in those tables can also change over time. So it's a snapshot in time of, of where these tests are. Um, right now, I, um, I would hate to say that they are available, but they will be available. Angela has an interesting question. Uh, What's a reasonable timeline for the eight steps that you outlined towards the implementation of performance specifications? Oh, um, I think, uh, yeah, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, it can go vary from, you know, depending on where you start, right? I mean, I showed the map earlier 
pop up. Here's the map I showed it. If you're starting in a, a certain point and you only want to go not too far, we're talking two, three, four years, but if you are wanting to take the long journey of evaluating tests, constructing test sections, uh, evaluating how those tests will perform within your um, agency, uh, doing all of the training aspects and, and interpreting it as part of your research. Well, we're talking about five, seven plus years. Um, and so it entirely <clears throat> depends on where you start, where you want to end, what, how much. And, and as I mentioned, you could just do one test. You could do two tests. You could do five tests. You may even do 10 tests I, um, for different uh, aspects of performance. Uh, of course, the more elements you incorporate, um, the more detailed testing methods you incorporate, whether you're doing uh, just index-based tests or more performance modeling tests, um, all of those are considerations. So it could be anywhere from a few years to I don't know, even 10 years. And, and again, like I said, you're constantly moving forward, so you're never done. Um, you have better, better tools, better software tools, better tests. Uh, better uh, uh, construction practices, better materials uh, to evaluate. So I, I think it's a journey, uh, and so it takes some time. Um, next question. Uh, James would like to know, has anyone looked at uh, the cost benefits of implementing performance specifications? Hmm. That's, um, <laughs> you know, one of my slides, I kind of alluded to the fact that it really it's a long, um, process because what you're trying to do is uh, uh, look at this more from a long-term perspective. You have to have enough contractors who can do this, um, where they are comfortable doing this, where they can reduce their prices or give you a better product at a certain uh, price point for doing this. Um, so it really takes I would think that once an agency has established a strong performance specification program, it may take 10, 15 years before you can see the impacts of that either on performance itself or on cost. Um, I know that when um, the Illinois Tollway, for example, uh, implemented the uh, performance specifications for concrete, they did um, have a large, very large project where they had um, broken it down into multiple contracts. And uh, in that project, they did see uh, benefits, uh, cost benefits of going to the performance specification for concrete. Um, there were certain um, requirements and uh, in terms of the, the strength, thickness, and right quality, and so on. So uh, there was many different aspects to that. And they, there was some um, uh, benefits out of that. Uh, but again, you won't really see this until you have it part of your uh, uh, regular agency practice. I, I think it, it would take some time before we could see any um, true statistical um, um, improvement in, um, of benefits in terms of cost. Well, thank you again, Shri. We're unfortunately running out of time. We do have several other questions that we're unable to get to. If you do also have questions that we haven't addressed, you see Dr. Rao's uh, email address here within the next 24 hours. Feel free to send him an email. He'll be excited and delightful to answer those questions. And we do ask to be respectful and pose only questions that are informational rather than consulting based. Can I have the next slide, please? So just as a reminder, everyone joining today's webinar for the entire program of one hour is entitled to receive a PDH certificate and a PDF copy of the presentation. Please allow two weeks to receive your certificate. And uh, if you have any questions, contact us at ARA webinars at ARA.com. Next slide, please. And the final slide for today, I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, ARA is a great company. We're 1,500 plus strong individuals. As I mentioned previously, 35 to 40 offices, depending on if you count our satellite offices, which is where I reside in one of them. We strive to hire the highest valued colleagues. Uh, and one of our mottos and our mantra is science and engineering for fun and profit. So if you're interested in employment opportunities, which currently exist at ARA transportation and infrastructure offices, 
please send a brief resume and your contact information to the website that's provided here. Thank you all again. And if we didn't get to your questions again, send an email directly to Sri. We'll be happy to answer you. God bless you all. Have a great day. Thank you.